This is the Orlando Sentinel editorial board interview with the judicial candidates for the Ninth Judicial Circuit, Group 14. We have with us today the incumbent, Judge Beamer, uh, and Michael Stewart, his challenger. And we are going to spend about, um, about 25 minutes talking about some of the issues that are that are confronting the judiciary um, without getting too much into or without getting into things that obviously you aren't allowed to, to address. Um, and I want to start with a, a question that um, I think is something that's foremost on everybody's mind when you start thinking about um, potential judge candidates. Um, if you could Describe for us what you believe constitutes um, a necessary judicial temperament and how you would or do um, carry that forward on the bench. Um, and we'll, since we'll start with the challenger, Mr. Stewart. So thank you, Chris. So a judge needs to be fair, impartial, but they need to have control of the courtroom. It is a serious place where serious business is conducted. And when people come into the courtroom, they need to be treated with respect and dignity. And one of the most important things is the judge should never be the focus of the case. We shouldn't want to hear about things that, the, you know, a story about a judge losing their cool and it makes it up in the news. We don't want that. We want someone that is going to be treating people, the litigants, the attorneys, the witnesses, all stakeholders that come before the court with dignity and fully listening to everything that's said and be, but you have to have a, a right amount of firmness to make sure that the process is controlled and people realize that it is a serious process. And I think that's, it's a very delicate balance that you need to do. You balance the approachability of the court with the seriousness of the proceeding, but making sure you're firm and keeping everything under control. And it's a difficult balance, but it's one I believe I would be able to do successfully. Good morning, Ms. Luger, and thank you for um, having us here. Um, I actually agree with Mr. Stewart. I think one of the biggest things that a judge needs to bring with them into the courtroom is an air of humility, knowing that we haven't walked in the shoes of the litigants that are before us each day, um, and especially for me dealing in cases with family law. Um, I'm dealing with individuals that perhaps are seeing me on some of their darkest times. Emotions run very high, and I think that the judge has to be uh, a voice of reason, a voice of calmness, and otherwise a difficult emotional situation. Um, and I also agree that the judge has to be firm. Our rulings from the bench are what carry the day in the courtroom, uh, regardless of whether or not lawyers or litigants agree with us. Um, but having everyone that comes to the court feel that the judge is listening, that they're providing fair, thoughtful, and considerate rulings, um, that they're not yelling or raising their voice uh, if they you know, something gets out of hand, uh, but really to make sure that everyone coming in front of us not only is comfortable in a very nerve-wracking sometimes situation, but also that we engender confidence and we portray confidence so that the people in front of us have faith in our judicial system. Thank you very much. Um, and I, I kind of wanted to carry that forward a little bit. Um, there are, in, in today's world, um, a judges are sometimes put on the spot, um, poked at for their personal beliefs. Um, people will dig into your background sometimes and try to find things that indicate how they believe you may rule. Um, how does a judge cope and maintain that air of neutrality when they become the focus of, of attention? Um, and we can start, please, with Judge Bima. Yes, um, I think that one of the biggest things uh, that a judge needs to have, aside from that humility, is an emotional intelligence um, to realize that they are not the focal point of, of the courtroom, that the litigants in front of them are, um, and really being calm and measured uh, when things like that happen. Uh, we've seen it in the news. Um, I can think of here recently in Central Florida, where one particular instance we've seen it um, actually happen. And in order to cope with that, understanding that our job is not to uh, focus on that, but to focus on the job at hand and service to our community. Um, 
when we get too far, I guess, into looking at ourselves um, and, and seeing things that are said or potentially said about us outside of the courtroom, um, it's one of the things that you simply have to ignore um, and be able to override that and know that the people in front of you are the ones that are looking to you to in the hard decisions sometimes in these cases and knowing that you're doing that according to the law based on your uh, experience um, and on each case it comes before you on its own merits um, but quite frankly just being able to kind of override that and look past it and really do the job that the people expect us to do um, rather than get caught up in the, the mire of things that might be said about us one of the roles of a judge is to to educate and it's not just in the courtroom it's outside the courtroom and now more than ever we've seen how important judges are because we've had some very substantial supreme court rulings one in particular where 50 years of precedent had been overturned and people have questions they don't understand why it was overturned what was the underlying reasoning and when you hear these terms like judicial philosophy it matters how people view the law how they view the constitution so it's it's very important that 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 the judge goes out there and they're prepared to explain their thought process of how they approach the law when interpreting it and so people can understand and be fully informed about the process because these are some of the most important jobs on the ballot and if you're true to yourself and true to your belief system you shouldn't have to worry about people digging up what you're going to say you're going to do the right thing and you know I would encourage people to look into the backgrounds of the judges, look into legal memberships, because it is important. It goes to how you view the law and how you will interpret the law. And there is nothing more important, as we've seen from recent events, than how judges approach the law and interpret the law. And that's how I feel about that. If I could follow up on that really quickly, um, you mentioned memberships. Um, are there any memberships addressing yourself only? Um, that you have that you believe would inform voters of anything about your candidacy? They, well, I mean, I'm, I am a member of the, the League of Women Voters of Orange County, which they're a nonpartisan organization. They don't necessarily get involved in, in legal. Um, uh, they, they're not a legal organization that really deal with interpreting the law. But I know you just said not to address, uh, just to address myself, but yeah, one of the biggest ones is, is the Federalist Society. Um, when you say you are a member of that organization, uh, that carries a statement, and there is an interpretation method that goes through that, and I think it's important that voters understand what that is and what that means and how that thought process works, and that most importantly, there's another way of looking at the law and interpreting the Constitution and statutes, which we can go into, but you dress specifically me, so I'll stop there. Thank you. Um, Judge Beamer? Um, I mean, yes, I, I think that uh, there are organizations that I'm involved in, the Orange County Bar Association, the Greater Orlando Asian American Bar Association, the Federal Society, my church. Um, all of these, in, in all of these groups, I encounter varying and competing ideas through these organizations. But I also believe that people are nuanced and complex. They're much broader than their membership to an organization and much more than the labels that people affix to them because of that association. Um, these labels require people to make unfair assumptions about people without knowing their background. They hear one word and they automatically have a, a preconceived notion. And I think that as a judge, we should be fair and open-minded to all varying viewpoints. We should be considerate and listen to the arguments and the people before us. And then, and only then, after we've heard all of the facts and the arguments under the law, make a decision applying that law fairly and equally to people. I don't think that membership in an organization defines an individual it certainly doesn't define me i wanted to ask a, a quick question following up to several statements here um we know that every person deserves a fair and equal opportunity right to be heard by a judge um but i wanted to know specifically from from each of you how would you work to make your courtrooms more approachable especially for non-english speakers and many uh, people that come from other areas especially what i cover which is like latin america latino hispanic communities that sometimes don't feel as comfortable uh going into a courtroom if we can start with uh judge beamer uh if you want to mention what you've done uh, during your tenure here and what would you change or keep working on? So that's actually a very good point. And I see that quite a bit, especially with self-represented parties that 
either um, don't have an attorney or many people who can't afford an attorney. And a lot of those individuals, for them, English is a second language. Um, now, under the rules of judicial administration, there has to be a certified court interpreter in order to, um, to proceed in that fashion. However, if there is no court reporter that's available, the judge can actually certify an individual to, to interpret. And one of the things that came out of the pandemic, uh, of course, is um, our, our conducting uh, procedures and proceedings via Zoom. Uh, which I found is more economically feasible, especially for individuals who can't afford a lawyer. They don't have to drive down to the courthouse, fight traffic, you know, find parking spaces. And for those non-English speaking individuals, they don't then have to have a friend fight that same traffic to get into the courtroom. But they can do that from their own home with a family member who swears under oath to truthfully and accurately translate from, you know, sometimes it's English to, Span English to Spanish, Spanish to English, um, Haitian Creole, I've had Mandarin speaking uh, individuals, um, but being able to provide that level of ease because um, I can't imagine what it would be like trying to understand a complex legal proceeding in a language that is not your first language and having that individual there with them to interpret that they're familiar and comfortable with, I think gives them uh, an air of, I don't want to say confidence, but some ease in knowing that they are being heard and that the judge is listening to what they are actually saying even if the judge doesn't speak their, their native language. Um, we've done that and continue to do that through the pandemic and even now that we've gone back in person. Um, and I think that our system here, especially in the Ninth Circuit, has been incredibly flexible and incredibly accommodating um, to those individuals. And those are the kind of things that I like to see and that uh, we keep pushing forward um, to making sure that everyone has equal access to the court system and that no one feels um, disenfranchised or alone when they're coming into court. Thank you, Mr. Stewart. You know, one of the benefits of expansive technology is that we don't necessarily have to have on staff interpreters in the courtroom at all times. And we may be able to bring in court, like well, Spanish is one that's gonna be more prevalent in Orange and Osceola counties, but there may be some other languages where it's just not cost effective enough to have someone on staff in those courtrooms. And then for the civil cases, you're not entitled to one necessarily. So I think what's really crucial is we use these new benefits of technology so that people can come in and have an accurate interpretive session and have a judge that's going to fully listen and be fully considerate of what they're going to say. The problem is, is when you have family members inter or friends interpreting things, you are leaving yourselves open to, oh, well, you know, they weren't really legally sophisticated and they missed up this word and I didn't fully understand what was going on. And you risk proceedings, hearings and rulings being undermined. So we really need to make sure that we're having the right interpretive methods, making sure, and if it's necessarily a funding issue, something that's maybe the, the chief judge can address, the legislative process, that's not something a circuit court judge addresses, but we need to be using as many advanced tools as we can. And one of the greatest, one of the things that has come out of the pandemic that's really helped revolutionize our court system is this ability to use this virtual technology for both civil and criminal cases, and things will need to be balanced with it. But I think that's really crucial and making sure people are comfortable, making sure that their their voices are heard and that they feel heard and not just pushed aside because, oh, you know, English isn't my first language and the person in that chair doesn't understand me. I think that's really crucial. And, and I think we're really going to have a great opportunity with this technology to help bring more people in and feel that they are being heard in their proceedings. Thank you very much. You have both spoken. Uh, very positively of your experiences with remote um, court hearings, remote appearances by by litigants, hearings. Um, what are some drawbacks? And I know that you've both experienced this technology, Mr. Stewart as a public defender and, and Judge Beamer as, as judge. Um, what, what are some drawbacks that you've seen and what should a judge do to manage these? And I think we start with Mr. Stewart. Thank you. Um, and, and just to be clear, I'm, I currently practice civil law. So since the pandemic, I, I, I was I was a public I left the public defender's office in 2016. The biggest issues that we have with the openness of technology is, you know, a lot of us take it for granted. There are a lot of people in our community that don't have reliable internet access. 
So they may not be able to get a clear, crisp connection to get in the courtroom or may not even have the internet access at all. Um, additionally, presentation of evidence, being able to view documents can become cumbersome and difficult. And when you get into the criminal context, you now have constitutional issues because there's confrontation issues the, where the, the accused needs to be able to see the person in the seat in person. Uh, you can't just have the video conference and the jury the, and the accused need to be able to view the people in person. So balancing all those issues, the confrontation issues, access of people who may not be able to fully use it is, is something that we need to fully craft and fully make sure that we consider. And obviously we still need to make sure we have the ability to have people come in in person and if they want an in-person hearing, they can have an in-person hearing. But, you know, to force people to come in for virtual hearings can become problematic because there are a number of people, a lot of people in our community that do not necessarily have the ability to have that stable internet connection or stable ability to, to be present at a virtual hearing. Um, but those are some of the biggest issues I have is access to the technology themselves for some of the litigants, as well as balancing the constitutional rights of someone that's criminally accused and the ability of a jury. And even in a civil case, juries need to be able to see the witnesses. There aren't, there aren't the constitutional protections there. And it's a little bit easier to have the witnesses appear there because of that. But those are the biggest safeguards is, are we fully getting the ability of uh, the witness and I'm, I'm sorry, the, the parties and the jury to evaluate the witness as well as people's ability to access the technology and be able to effectively use it and be able to present their case and feel like they were actually heard. So these are some of the things that we see on, on a daily basis, especially in the family law courtroom. Now, com coming on this side of the pandemic and even through the pandemic, the criminal proceedings were still going on in person because of those constitutional protections. Um, what I have noticed uh, with respect to the technology, I mean, if we're honest, we've been doing this for a very long time with telephonic appearances. As long as they have someone that is present, a witness or a party has someone that's present that can verify their identity and swear them in under oath. Um, we've been doing that before. But with Zoom and the internet connection, some people are, are doing these hearings, especially litigants. They're attending from their phone uh, in areas where they might have dead spots. They might have connectivity issues. One of the things that at least I know that I've done in my division uh, is is more a method of time management and budgeting time and understanding that there are people that are going to have uh, challenges with the technology, challenges with their connection issues and expanding the uh, amount of hearing time and budgeting, you know, five or 10 minutes on either side of hearing so that when you run into those technology issues and somebody cuts off or they freeze on Zoom, that you're not backing up all the other hearings that are behind you. And so managing that time, understanding that there are going to be those issues that come up, um, that has been really beneficial, at least in my division. Another thing that the court system does, because we do have individuals uh, that simply do not have Internet access and some even in today's age in 2022 who do not have a computer or an email account. Now, I know at the Orange County Courthouse, we have kiosks available for those individuals that if, if they're coming for a, a virtual hearing, um, especially when, during the pandemic when you know, um, social distancing was very important to stop the spread of, of COVID. Um, we had dedicated areas where they could come in actually to the courthouse and sit at a computer kiosk with no connectivity issues and no problems. We had court IT staff that were able to help them set up their, their Zoom meeting and to log in um, to that. So that's some of the uh, things that we provided. I know that we've done it numerous times. Um, in family law cases for those individuals so that we're not um, hamstringing people with their access to the court system simply because of a lack of technology or a, an inability to access it. We're pro we've been providing that to them so that they can still um, have their full and fair opportunity to be heard. Jennifer, do you have any more? I had just a couple. I have one that, that I know that one of our colleagues who's not here today always wants um, to, to add. And it's like if you each can point out to a specific moment or a specific reason in which you uh, realized and decided that this was the next course in, in your career that you want to run for, for this position, if you can mention um, that, uh, if we can start with Mr. Stewart. The specific moment when I realized that I wanted to run for office is uh, was in March of 
21 when uh, I applied to the Judicial Nominating Commission to uh, be a judge. And I went through the process because you know, they said they had wanted more qualified people to apply for the positions. And they were concerned that they were supposedly getting the same people applying over and over again. And I was like, well, you know what? If you want to make the system better, you got to try and at least put yourself out there. And when I went through the process, what I found was it was there it was a for a nonpartisan job it was a political process i mean there was when you look at the the membership of the people that are being selected for the positions federalist society when you look at the the people that are being selected whether it's husband and wife teams uh not teams but husband and wives being appointed friends of people that work at the office of the general counsel and like i said membership in the federalist society it was a concern for me and you know to, to come and say well i'm just a member of the federalist society but it doesn't define who i am but i'm also a member of the orange county bar association in goaba orange county bar association and goaba are not organizations that deal with interpretive methods of how you look at the law the federalist society is an organization that is a proponent of a specific philosophy of interpreting the constitution that we look at when interpreting the constitution for example that we should be looking at 18th century circumstances, what happened when the Bill of Rights or when the 14th Amendment was passed in the 1868 to define what things like liberty, cruel and unusual punishment, and the freedom of speech mean. That is a philosophy that I personally disagree with. And that's an organization that I would not, that I'm not a member of. And I think that we should, we should have judges that have a different philosophy than that, that we should have more diversity of thought, that we should have people that believe our constitution is a set of values and the question is those values, like the ones I just listed, how do those values apply today in light of our circumstances, the purpose and consequences behind that provision? It's a different way of interpreting the constitution and it's a different way of interpreting the law. And I think it is important. And we're not talking about social voluntary bar associations. We are talking about an organization that is a proponent of specific legal interpretation methods. It is directly relevant to the job and I wanted to to challenge someone that advertised their membership in that organization, which is what I wanted to do. So the defining moment was when I applied, I went through the process and I determined that if I wanted to help make the system as good as it can be, I needed to put myself out there and give voters another choice. Thank you very much. Judge Beamer, if you want to point out what made you uh, run the first time and if that has changed now, you're going into re-election. Mine actually didn't start with any um, external, um, I guess, motivator, except to say that when I was young, I was in college, I knew I wanted to be a lawyer. And a good friend of mine, the late James Nidefer, who was a general magistrate in my hometown, um, he had practiced criminal defense law and he now become a magistrate. And he allowed me to shadow him. He'd been a great mentor and friend. And I remember sitting and asking him, um, you know, as someone who didn't understand the legal process and what it meant to be a lawyer, um, how it was defending criminal uh, or, or people who've been alleged to have committed crimes um, and now being a magistrate. And he looked at me and said, John, it's not about whether or not somebody did something or didn't do something. It's about making sure that the law is followed and that everybody coming in front of me understands that they're going to be treated fairly regardless of what I did in the past as a criminal defense attorney or what I've done as a, as a civil attorney. But now in this position, it really means fidelity to the law. And to me, that was an inspiration that someone was able to set aside everything that they had done before and know that this job is something that carries a great deal of weight. I think that the court system is the, the one branch of government that is most likely to have a direct impact on individual lives here in our community. You're not gonna see a lot of people that go and talk to their legislators or talk to the, their governor, um, whether it be in Tallahassee or whether it be in Washington, DC, but you will find somebody that you know who has been in front of a judge and that judge has made a decision that has affected their life directly at that very moment. And for me, it's a matter of service. I've always wanted to be in this position I come from a family of service. My grandfather, my father, my uncle, they were all in the Navy. I was the first man not to join the service. And when I look at my particular skill set, this is the way that I'm able to serve our community. It's nothing more than that. It's a passion for service.
Thank you very much. I had I had one more question that I wanted to ask, and we we kind of skirted around this and and other questions, but um, one of the greatest challenges that a judge faces, and in family court, this happens, as as has been mentioned, quite a lot, um, is when you have an unrepresented uh, litigant in front of you, um, somebody who's trying to get custody of his kids or somebody who is um, alleging domestic violence. These are, you know, there are very strict rules that they're supposed to follow, and they often have no idea how to do that. How do you balance maintaining the strict guidelines that, that the legal process requires and making sure that people who don't have attorneys are fairly represented? I can speak to that directly. Um, yeah. and, and because the law does apply equally across the board, whether you're represented by counsel or not, um, a judge cannot be an advocate. Once we, if a judge steps into the role of an advocate, we have now lost our impartiality. And so if you suggest to a, even an unrepresented litigant uh, an argument to make or, or what, you're, what you're looking for, I believe that you cross the line from your very narrowly defined role of being a fair arbiter of the facts um, and judging them. Just like if you were to tell an attorney, well, if you made that objection, I might have sustained it. That's not the role of the court. Now, that being said, I have had that happen when individuals come in front of me and they can't afford a lawyer. They have tried to get a lawyer and they can't pay for it or one won't take their case. There are avenues that I'm I'm obligated and quite freely um, suggest to them. For instance, in our courthouse, we have a self-help department where there are individuals down there that can point them to the, the correct forms they need to fill out. Fill out. Um, in Orange County, we actually even have attorneys on staff that will take appointments. And I believe they charge $1 a minute, um, but they will sit down with a litigant and review their cases. Um, I've directed them to that self-help department. I've also provided them, we have cards that direct them to the Orange County Bar Association, the Office of Legal Aid for individuals that um, can't afford an attorney, they can go and, and uh, retain one of the uh, legal aid attorneys. Um, if nothing more than to just help them walk through the initial steps of, of getting in. Another thing that we do is uh, we have case management conferences. And as I said, a judge can't be an advocate, but a judge can tell people what the law is. And so I've pointed litigants to the specific statutes, uh, for instance, Section 61.13, which controls um, the factors for time sharing, and 61.30, uh, which controls child support. They need to know where to look for this information, and it's not stepping outside of your role to tell them where those statutes can be found and what they need to do and then to be able to point them to lawyers that may be able to help them. Um, and I think that gives them a, a little bit more confidence, a little bit more security, knowing that they can at least find someone um, to talk to and having that information. I think a lot of it is a lack of information and a lack of not knowing where to look for those resources um, in, those, in those very trying times uh, for individuals. Mr. Stewart? Thank you. Yeah, it is a delicate balance, Chris. It is, you have to balance the, you wanna treat everyone fairly and you wanna make sure justice is had, but at the same time, you can't have some pro se litigant get dunked on by an attorney because they don't know what they're doing. So the role of the judge in the courtroom is to help make sure that fairness is happening. You can't tell them what the law is, but when you see that they're 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 asking for something that they may not be using those magic words but they the result they're trying to get is right but the things they're using or the rule of procedure they're citing isn't necessarily correct there's a way to mediate it and get people to the right result and one of the biggest concerns i have is is how people who aren't perceived as having money aren't perceived as having power or treated in the court system. Because I, I worked at the public defender's office. I know what it's like when you you, you represent someone. In those cases, they're represented because you have a, of an attorney. I know your question was about pro se, but it's it's similar because it's it, we're talking about individuals that are not gonna be perceived as having power or necessarily money when they come to the courtroom and how they can get treated. And unfortunately, a lot of times, they end up with second tier justice. I've witnessed that personally as an, an attorney, 
And my clients, when I was at the public defender's office, would also experience the results of that. And I think having that realization, being able to self-check yourself and make sure that people are being treated properly and justice and fairness is being carried out in those courtrooms is key. And I think that's one of the things that makes me in a more unique circumstance because I've had that experience representing people in a, not the same circumstance, but it's similar to the pro se. But that's the, that is the delicate balance you have to, to, to carry out. Making sure fair, everyone's being treated equal, equitably and equally, but not letting someone just get taken advantage of because they don't know the right words to say, or maybe what they're doing may not be legally proper, but what they're trying to get at is correct. So that is the delicate balance that needs to be to be crafted, while at the same time understanding what the reality is behind the scenes and what the judge can do to make sure the proper things are being done to make sure justice is carried out in their courtrooms. Well, um, I want to thank you both for spending this time with us. We have come to the end of our time, and and I just wanted to ask each of you to make a brief statement about why you should be the voter's choice in this race. Um, please try to keep it to around a minute so we can uh, keep our keep our video. But thank you. All right, let's we'll start actually um, with the challenger, Mr. Stewart. Thank you, Chris. Uh, I believe the people of Orange and Osceola County should be choosing who has the privilege of serving as their judge, and we should not just be accepting what's been chosen for us. And I believe when you look at the objective qualifications between me and my opponent, under every objective standard, I am the more qualified person for this job. Don't just listen to the nice words. Don't just listen to the platitudes. Let's look at the objective things that you can measure. I'm the only person in this race that has practiced both civil and criminal law as an attorney for years. My opponent never did criminal law as an attorney. I'm the only per I, in this race, I tried 29 jury trials as an attorney. My opponent only tried 10 jury trials as an attorney. I'm the only person in this race that graduated from a top tier law school with honors. My opponent did not. When I was in law school, I was the only person whose academic performance got me the ability to do an externship at the Fifth District Court of Appeals. My opponent did an internship at the state attorney's office. Uh, I'm the only person in this race that has never been sanctioned by a court as a practicing attorney. My opponent cannot say that. I'm the only person in this race that was never put on a quote unquote corrective action plan by my employer because of my conduct in court. My opponent cannot say that. And I am the only person that's not a member of the Federalist Society. You heard about my judicial philosophy. You heard about how I view the law. I would ask you to look at the background of both myself and my opponent and look into the organizations and see if that is something and that is a set of values based on your own research based on your own uh, abilities, whether that is someone that you want sitting in a job in your, in, in your community, judging people, evaluating the law. And the most important thing to keep in consideration for these jobs, the people in these circuit court judge positions are the most likely candidates to fill appellate court seats. And they have the ability to potentially shape law that affects the entire state. So please evaluate the background, the objective background between the two candidates and look at those judicial philosophies and make sure you get an answer on the judicial philosophy of the incumbent. Not just hear about the, uh, their members of voluntary bar associations. Ask about the Federalist Society, look into it and make a determination for yourself if that's what you want in a judge in your community. Thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you. Um, judge Beamer, if you wanna take the opportunity before you give us your closing statement to respond to any of that, um, I I would I would love to give you that opportunity. Well, thank you, Ms. Fluker. Um, first, I'd be curious as to which court I've ever been sanctioned, and I'm not aware of any sanctions that have been levied against me as an attorney. Um, that's some some interesting news uh, for me to hear. Um, but when we talk about our experience and we talk about what we've done, what I've done specifically, I've handled ten civil jury trials, seven of those being lead counsel. I think I'm the only person in this race that can claim that. I've also handled um, appeals and argued before the district court's appeal. Again, I'm the only person in this race that can claim that. I'm also the only person in this race that actually has experience being a judge and seeing people that come before me in their darkest times. And sometimes they share their most beautiful moments, like the 50 adoptions that I've done. 
and the families that I've been able to bring together, the hundreds of trials that I've presided over, the thousands of hearings that I've presided over, and each person that's come in front of me who has walked away feeling that they got their fair shake in front of a judge. Now, judges can't make promises about how they handle each case, but I can promise you this, that I will be fair under the law to every single person that comes into my courtroom, but I'm not going to leave my heart in some law library. I'll use my experience as a person, as an attorney, as a judge to provide thoughtful and considerate rulings for the people in our community. And that's why I'm seeking to retain my seat and continue to serve the people of Orange and Osceola counties. Now, a big deal has been made about the Federalist Society. But again, I don't think that pigeonholing someone into one single facet of what they are defines a person. I think that's the exact opposite of what you want in a judge. You want a judge who is going to take each case on its merits, is going to treat everyone fairly. I have a track record of doing so, and I will continue to do so when I'm reelected or when I'm retained to serve this community on the bench. Thank you very much. Um, just a reminder, this race will be on the August 23rd ballot. It is open to all voters because it is a nonpartisan race <clears throat> and the in the Ninth Judicial Circuit, which is Orange and Osceola counties. Um, so and once again, I'm going to thank uh, my colleague Jennifer and um, and both of you for joining us.